Hello. So why am I making this video? Well, building a business is very hard. A business where you're working for yourself. I am a freelance brand strategist and I've been freelancing for about two and a half, three years off and on. Everything that I've learned as a freelancer, I've learned from other freelancers or people that worked for themselves. So I would like to share some of the things that I am learning here in case it helps other people as well. I never thought I'd be making a video for YouTube. I would like to make this be a bit more conversational and like we're just chit-chatting. So lessons that I've learned in the last month of freelancing. Number one, pay for services that make your life easier. If you can budget it, there are certain things that if they're going to save you a lot of time and you don't need to be spending your time and energy doing it, it's worth paying for. For me, that month it was Calendly. It's a service where it connects with your calendar and lets people make appointments directly and you can make all kinds of different events like a 25-minute meeting, a 40-minute meeting. I have one that's just virtual coffee chats and I have that set for Fridays and Mondays only and you can set your working hours. So if you hate doing calls on Monday mornings like I do, you can make that not an option and it just saves so much time with the back and forth. Some people don't like it because they think it feels a little robotic, but I think that it just saves everyone time. No one likes doing those emails with a back and forth listing of times. So it saves time on both ends. And you can also customize the questions to sound more like you. I even include a question that asks people their favorite karaoke song because I love karaoke and I'm making a playlist out of all of those at the moment. It gets like a fun little jolt of joy in my inbox when I see that. So that's been one where I upgraded. And the reason I upgraded with that is that you can connect multiple calendars. You can create multiple event types. It just allows for more features. And I believe it's only like $8 a month for the basic upgrade. Definitely worth it. The other one that I started paying for this month is called otter.ai. And it essentially joins your Zoom calls and will take notes digitally. It uses AI to do so. Then you can put comments and summarize I find it really helpful because I, I first started using it because I was doing research interviews. And so it, was, it took like a lot more in-depth notes and I really wanted to get what people were saying. But I've kept it around because I take a lot of analog notes in a notebook and it can take a lot of time to type those things up. So instead, I now have this digital version that I can do search and I don't have to be typing up my notes all the time. So I don't know if I'll stick with that one, but I am really enjoying it. I really need to upgrade my Zoom because I keep getting the 40 minute mark and it's so lame to get that response that you're like running out of time when you're on a professional call. But it is kind of nice because it also makes you wrap up your calls a lot faster. And if I know that I'm on an important call and I, I don't want that message to pop up, I'll just do it on Google Meet. But I should probably pay for Zoom. <laughs> Next lesson is that Squarespace is better than Wix. I redid my site this past month and I was using Wix for several years. I thought it was easy enough for a simple one pager. So I went in there to start redoing my site again. And it all started with a simple need to have an accordion menu, which is essentially when you like something is collapsed and you click on it and it expands. And I could not find an easy way to do it. I thought it was a really simple thing that was going to be there and it was very difficult. So I found it on Squarespace. And then when I started to poke around Squarespace, everything was so much easier. Everything with layout was easier. They have like all these little square things that help you line things up better. It was just so much more intuitive and so much easier to drag things around. I just felt like they had more features and better templates for when you're looking to do more than just a very simple one pager. And now when I go back in Wix, I'm like, I don't understand how anything works in here. So it is a bit more expensive, I believe. I'm not sure on the exact cost. I think for a year at Squarespace, I'm paying around $250. I believe Wix was much less than that. But I definitely think it's worth it if you're trying to do anything more than a very simple one pager. And even if you're trying to do a simple one pager, Squarespace is a lot easier. Next lesson, how to name my company and my podcast, my upcoming podcast mini series. I always did business as Brandy Cerny. I never had a company name and I still am not an LLC. I'm still just operating as an independent contractor. So I don't actually have to have an LLC name. But when I was redoing my website, I decided that I wanted to have some form of company name, what they call a DBA doing business as name. Because I'm not attaching it to an LLC, I thought I could maybe play around with it a little bit more. Since I niched down into just brand strategy, I thought, okay, is now the time to actually include brand and brandy in the same name? <laughs> Seems like a missed opportunity. I thought that it could be a fun little play on words. So I ended up going with 
brand by brandy. I was playing around with a few other things like let's get brandy, branding by brand, any combination of brand and brandy you would think of. I did a quick Google search to make sure these things didn't exist. There was some studio brandy, which was a couple of guys in the UK. <laughs> there was someone using the hashtag let's get brandy. So I just did a quick search, but there didn't seem to be a lot involving brand and brandy in the brand strategy space. The domain was available. If I should want to make social handles with it, I believe they're available. Unless you go and claim them right now and then charge me a big fee. Please don't do that because <laughs> I won't pay it. I had to name my podcast, which I'm doing a podcast mini series interviewing people who have transitioned out of social media into other marketing careers. I am pairing it with a workbook that I already did called Exploring a Marketing Career Beyond Social Media, which is a handful of a name for a podcast. So I decided to have something a little more quippier and fun for just that podcast mini series. The first thing that came to mind was handing over the passwords because I was trying to think of things that are very, very specific to that situation that every social media manager knows. And one of them is when you have to hand over the passwords. So I thought it represented well the idea of getting out of social media, but it was short enough. I did a quick search on the podcast apps. I didn't see any podcast name that because I think that's important that you aren't purposely taking other people's names if they already exist, plus it's confusing. But other than that, both of the processes were relatively simple and straightforward. If you're creating a business that you want to be bigger or you're making an LLC, there are a lot of other things you need to consider. Is something copyrighted? Is it taken? There can be a lot more to consider. But I think the lesson for me with these things that feel a little more like the podcast will be a mini series and my website, I can change that at any time if I want. I'm not necessarily committing to that for like the rest of my life. I think that the lesson was kind of like, don't overthink it. If you like a name and you feel like it covers the subject and you do a quick search and no one else has it, just go with it. Next lesson from this month is when dealing with downtimes, make improvements. Right now, almost every freelancer I know is going through a bit of a dry spell. For me, it is coming on because of the economic downturn. But then also when I was laid off a few months ago, I decided to spend the time to really figure out what I want to be doing with this, getting back into freelancing, getting back into self-employment. I just wrapped up a 10-week cohort with Indie Collective, which helps independents kind of level up their business and get to the, to the next stage and make things more sustainable. So I've really been spending a lot of my time focused on that and just having some clients on the side to help sustain me. So I think that that mentality and mindset of what to do during downtime, what I find most important is to be intentional with what you're doing, because otherwise you're always going to feel like I don't have enough work. I'm not making enough money. I need to get more clients. I need to say yes. I need to do this. And so if you purposely tell yourself, okay, right now it's kind of a slow period. Companies don't know what they're doing. They are being more conservative with budgets until things even out. I think if you tell yourself, I'm going to use this time to finally upskill on this thing or to finally redo my website or to finally make SOPs, which is standard operating procedures for these processes I'm doing all the time. If you tell yourself that, it's a lot easier to ride the waves and to take some room to breathe. And we all know that when you are get really busy later with projects and clients, you don't have time to do these things. So it's best to ask yourself before you panic. Can I use this time to do something that's going to improve my business? I saw someone say on a Slack group that when they're going through down times and they need to use their savings, they will tell themselves, this is a gift from past me to present me. And I thought that was so lovely. And <laughs> a nice way to think about using your savings because sometimes we don't want to dip into that, but that's why they exist, right? Next lesson I learned is to send a formal contract. I always have included terms on my estimates that lay out things like timeline, if I'm taking any days off, when I'm going to get paid, my late fee, cancellation fees, number of edits. But I finally got convinced recently to actually send a formal contract because while it's good to have things in writing, having this in a contract is much safer. So I'm in this Slack community called OGC and the people there were really kind enough to give us this template of a consulting services agreement that they have. And someone walked us through how to use that. So I signed up for DocuSign to send it that way. And I sent my first one to a client and it just felt like a lot more professional and secure. 
I think you can still include those terms on your estimates, but setting the contract after, especially when you're getting into higher value projects, just feels more secure and legit. I also learned that I need to look into becoming an LLC because it basically gives you more liability coverage and separates your personal assets from your business if there were ever a problem there, which in a few years, I've never run into that, knock on wood. So hopefully I wouldn't, but I think that I should look into that next. That's what they advised. Another thing I learned this month is how to minimize distractions. An ongoing lesson for all of us in this world. In an indie collective session, someone, his name is Kyle Westway, he gave us some tips about using programs like Boomerang to pause your email. So I installed that as a Google add-on, a Google Chrome add-on. And now my email only comes in at 10 a.m., 12 p.m., 3 p.m., and 6 p.m. And if you need to like see something urgent, there's, they go into a little folder and you can grab them. But I find that I am someone who is really distracted when the little like number or the notification pops up. I leave my email open all day long and I like have to click on it. So having them come in at certain times just helps me not do that as much. He also proposed the system of when they come in at those times. So at 3 p.m. you go on, you deal with all of them. You either put them into your to-do list or you answer or triage them right away. And so I've been doing that and that's been super helpful. It's so easy because you don't really need your email to come in constantly the entire day. And when you do, like I said, you can look in the folder, but it gives you some time to have some deep work. So you're not thinking you need to respond to your email all day long. I also paired that with the app Freedom 2, which is a app that will block certain sites for you. So I used it to block LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, all the social media, basically. And again, I have these blocks of windows at 10 to 10.30, 12 to 12.30, 3 to 3.30, and so on, where it allows me to go on those sites. That's been helpful because basically I think, okay, at those times, that's when I'm going to answer email, check if I need to respond to something on LinkedIn, check if there's something new on Twitter. But beyond those, I don't go on the sites. And I find that really helpful because I found that I was just like anyone, you just go on autopilot, you like open up a tab and you're like LinkedIn. And you just go in there and you feel like you're like working because it's work related but you don't need to be doing that all day long. So it helps me with deep work. I'm also taking a step further and trying to only open Slack during those hours too. I'm in so many helpful Slack communities and I do have a few clients on Slack. So I do need to to check it often, but I don't need to be checking it all day long. And that little red bubble sits there and stares at me unless I click on it and those things are not urgent. So basically I'm trying to bundle all of my digital comms in this, these four, three hour No, sorry, in these four 30 minute slots during the day to leave time for deep work in between. And it's a work in progress, but so far it's helping so much. It takes a lot of customization when you first hop on to figure it out. As I mentioned in my count in the Calendly lesson too, I'm also scheduling coffee chats for only Fridays and Mondays, which is a suggestion from my friend Jan, because I was having too many and it was cutting into work time. And I love doing those coffee chats, but it was very distracting in like the middle of the week when I do the majority of my client work. The other lesson I learned this month is how to migrate your email and domain. If you change it, I changed from brandycerny.com to brandbybrandy.com and I changed my email as well. And for like the week or two where I had both, it was very annoying <laughs> because I was trying to have everything go for my new email, but then clients were responding to my old one and I was like, oh, can you use this one? And it was just like a bad process. There are three parts. You first have to do domain migration. So I was able to do that through Wix and Squarespace. It took a few days, though, for it to approve. But it was relatively easy to figure out on Squarespace. Oh, also, Squarespace directions are great. Wix directions are terrible. Anytime I go on a Wix help article, it's like, what are they talking about? Where are they directing me? I don't understand. Squarespace has been very helpful. Then you have to do an email data migration. So If you use Google Workspace, which I think a lot of people do, you can do it on Google. Google gives very detailed, although slightly complicated directions. But some combo of Google and Reddit helped me figure out how to do that in an afternoon. That was the best because that basically makes it so that all of your old emails forward to your new one and you can just use one inbox. And then the last part is calendar migration. So this is easy. You just export and import your calendar to whatever email address you want to use. So that only took a few minutes. If I had to rank the the directions, I would say Squarespace, good. Wix, bad. Google email migration, kind of good. 
uh, Reddit people, very good. All of this took about a week. But now that it's done, my life is a lot easier. The next thing I learned this month is how to make a podcast. Maybe I should do like a whole other video that is about that because that's been a fun experience. Not difficult. It is time consuming. My boyfriend, Carlos, has been helping me because his production studio, Mad Sounds Productions, they have their own podcast and they've made podcasts for other people. And so he's been very helpful leading me in the right directions and giving me some shortcuts that otherwise I would have had to do some internet sleuthing. Actually, a lot of shortcuts, but it's been a fun process and not that difficult. So I am in the phase where we are finishing up editing. Next, we'll be figuring out how to post it and promote it. So maybe I can do a how to make a podcast. Not how to make a podcast video because I don't want to instruct people how to make it, but the lessons I learned about making a podcast. But it's been very fun. I recommend it if you are interested. And I have a lot of resources with that. So that should be another video. I should maybe also do another video that's everything I learned in Indie Collective. Although obviously I can't list it all out, but you know the topics in case people are interested about that. So yeah, I would love to know what other people have learned. Is this video like terrible? Please bear with me with my first ever YouTube video. First ever video in general, agnostic of platform. I hope this is useful and I hope it, other people can see that when they are confused building their freelancing business, it's very normal and the best part of running your own business, in my opinion. No, not the best part. One of the best parts of running your own business is that you're constantly learning and it's nice to be able to look back and see what you've learned and feel a sense of progress. Bye.